In modern day times, Soma, there are lots of versions of meditation out there and it's becoming a very popular um, topic for people and many people are exploring meditation. I know for myself, I've um, practiced mindfulness meditation, Buddhist meditation and now exploring the, the yogic practices. What actually makes true meditation? This is a very um, valid question and indeed a lot of people are struggling with this question. The truth is that um, this question is more broad because uh, not only meditation is a topic that attracts people and we need to understand that meditation is part of spirituality as a path. Um, then the question would be more accurately, what is true spirituality? Because you can't measure or evaluate what is meditation without understanding the context of what meditation is part of. Unfortunately, in modern times we do find that a lot of people consider meditation to be something which is quite bereft of content. It is a little bit of a simple activity to make you more relaxed, to help people deal with stress, and perhaps to improve productivity in working environment, and something generally that we use in order to help us deal with our stressful lifestyle. And uh, by reducing meditation to just some sort of a relaxation practice, or perhaps something just to help us contemplate deeply and discover some deeper parts of ourselves, is actually uh, very limiting. And I'm saying that because that's what we find today with regards to spirituality as a whole. A lot of people look at the spiritual uh, interest that a human being may have as a kind of uh, interest in uh, just being more connected with the earth or being eco-friendly or just being a person who is a little bit religious or maybe more than a little bit religious and a lot of people keep it up to this point but when we look at things from the viewpoint of the authentic spirituality of India and to and Tibet as well uh, we find that for these individuals, the ancient yogis of India, and even many modern yogis of India, uh, we find that for them spirituality is much more than that. It's not just a lifestyle or life choices or just a way to bring your mind to be at peace and to be friendly with your neighbors and not to do negative things like the Ten Commandments or something like that. It goes far beyond that. And true spirituality actually means a path that a human being may take or may choose to take in order to very much fast forward their evolution. And we're talking about evolution from a spiritual standpoint. And according to the yoga uh, perspe pers perspective on, on the human life, we understand, and that's also from the tantric perspective, that we as human beings are born with a certain purpose, even if we don't understand it or don't believe in it but we have a certain purpose and our purpose is to evolve spiritually. Our purpose is to reach what the yogis call self-realization. Some call it enlightenment, liberation, or the names are many. And when we talk about self-realization, again, it's a very misunderstood concept, but at least the yogis understood it in a very technical, clear way. They didn't consider it to be some foggy, abstract concept that one day I was sitting and doing a meditation and I saw a bright light and therefore I declare myself enlightened and I've reached the end of my quest. Far from it. The yogis had a very clear system. This system was presented in various spiritual texts from the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali to other texts such as the Shiva Samhita, Garanda Samhita and others and others. And we find that in all these spiritual texts and in the traditions, the oral traditions come on, coming from the yogic background, that they considered spiritual practice to be a way of life. It is considered to be a way by which through certain techniques, practices and very clear steps in your evolution that you can verify with the help of a teacher or a guru that you have indeed transformed, this transformation takes place. And it's a transformation which is absolutely necessary. We can live our lives just enjoying our daily lives, having family life for some, having a, a good career, just uh, pursuing the pleasures of life and trying to have a life which was the most 
pleasurable, satisfying, fun life that a person could have had. But by doing that, we're missing out on our true purpose. And the spiritual teachings of yoga and tantra are actually focusing on that true spiritual purpose. Within that true spiritual purpose and the methodologies which are presented in this spiritual understanding of the purpose of our lives, comes meditation. And when we look at meditation in that context, it's very different. It's not anymore just something for relaxation or de-stressing or this would be ridiculous. We would say that actually meditation is considered to be one of the most advanced levels that a yogi can practice upon. For example, according to the great yogi called Patanjali a few thousand years back, he was saying in his famous text, the Yoga Sutras, that meditation is actually one of the eight levels or eight steps or stages in the yoga tradition. And that means that if we're starting from the first level, reaching to the number eight, which would be self-realization in one way or another, they have a technical name for it, then he considers that the one before that is meditation, which shows that it's a very advanced state. This is not a chaotic thing. It's not just some arbitrary or, I don't know, some kind of a, a, a improvisation type of practice that I sit, close my eyes and I try not to think. Or I just try to stop my mind. Or I'm just trying to focus on this or that. Meditation is supposed to be a state of consciousness, a state of mind. And that state of mind is defined clearly as a sort of expansion of the mind by Patanjali. Other yogis define it in similar ways. And the idea behind it is that it's, this very, it's a de very different state of mind than the daily state of mind that we have in a daily life. And it's a completely different state of mind. And that's why to do meditation in a kind of improvisation way, if we just do a kind of sitting meditation where we just sit, close our eyes and allow our minds to wander or have some associative thinking, chain of thinking, or if we're just trying to struggle with our minds, or if we're doing other things. Today you find dancing meditations, active meditations, all kinds. Then I'm not saying those things are negative. They can bring some beneficial effects to people. They can help in certain aspects of life. They can have psychological benefits. But that's different completely from what the yogis define as meditation. And the yogis consider that by learning the really specific techniques of concentration of the mind, meditation, according to the yogic principles, the mind can totally change and transform. And this transformation is very beneficial. It becomes extremely powerful. It has suddenly access to aspects that we never thought possible. And the human being can become a much, much greater being than what we perceive is possible these days. And that's where true meditation is aiming for on the authentic spiritual path. It might sound still a bit out there for people, so what does it actually mean? This is where the teachings are necessary. In all the spiritual texts and uh, the traditions of the yogis, they consider that spiritual teachings must be done responsibly. They can't just be given away on a video or just by reading books and so on. The information may be given to a degree as a kind of an opener for people to just open their eyes and develop the interest to follow a specific path. But it's essential to find a teacher that is accomplished in what they're doing and follow the path with proper guidance. And that's why to say how to meditate or what practically happens in the mind, it's very difficult just like that. You need to train yourself properly, find the, the, the right teacher, the accomplished teacher, and then the, the practice of meditation will literally take wings and you'll find that you are uh, simply stepping into a completely different environment, into a whole new dimension that can really transform you uh, and really take you further on your spiritual path. You were saying, Soma, that meditation is one of the highest levels when you were talking about Patanjali's Eight Limbs of Yoga. Um, what is the level before that? What's the most important thing to prepare for for meditation? Well, um, the one before meditation, according to Patanjali, is uh, concentration of the mind. But the truth is that uh, all the levels 
leading up to meditation are essential. And all these levels, from the Yama Niyamas, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, and all the levels there, they're all essential because they somehow build certain aspects of the human mind and uh, generally the structure of the human being. And um, that's why we can't isolate one or two of them and just say that these are the most important. They're all very essential. But it is true that as we go higher in those levels mentioned by the famous Patanjali, we find that the higher the levels, the more internal the practice becomes, the more it leads to some deeper aspects of my mental work, mind or mental work. And that's why for meditation, it's important to clarify that it's very impossible, I would say, to really say that a person can meditate if they have very little understanding and zero control over their own minds. It's impossible to do that. But unfortunately, in the times that we live in, we don't find that people are encouraged to actually understand how the mind works. Swami Shivananda used to call it mental culture. And this is something that doesn't exist hardly at all in modern times. We go to school, university, whatever. <clears throat> we, are demand, we are being uh, asked to uh, study for exams, to memorize various materials, and to basically have success in our studies and in our careers. But nobody really teaches us how to actually achieve that. They just say, study hard, get the results. So I study, I read, I try to memorize as much as I can, and when the exam comes, I kind of pour out all that I've memorized. And many people will admit freely that a few days or weeks after the exam, more than 50% of the information is lost because they only did it for that specific moment to pour out the knowledge, show that I've memorized according to what I was requested to memorize, and that's it. That is a very poor use of the mind. And we're surprised why we don't find so much creativity, greatness, genius in modern times. And the point is that the yogis consider the mind to have much, much more potential. And to work with the mind the right way is an art in its own, uh, in its own way. And that's why the yogis actually taught us how we can develop our minds. And it all starts with something which is not very popular these days, and that is learning to control our own minds. Uh, in modern times, we find that the way things are, we are so bombarded and, and continuously being showered by constant stimulation from the, the, the entertainment industry, from our internet usage, from our um, interaction socially, from a million and other things, marketing, advertising. We are all the time bombarded and the mind is just all over the place. And it was already considered in ancient times that the mind is very difficult to control as it is. In the last 100 years, it's just exponentially much worse. And then when you tell to the average person, you need to stop, center yourself, focus, not on something interesting like a magazine or a video game or I don't know, whatever people enjoy doing these days, but just on something very simple like a leaf from a tree or, or a teaspoon. The mind will scream with pain because this is totally boring. The mind needs to jump around. We don't know how to control the mind. The thing is that when we learn to control the mind, when we learn how to focus, concentrate the mind, and there are techniques for that, it can be and it is extremely difficult for a lot of people in the beginning. And because of that, our own mind fights this and will never allow us to do this unless we are really persistent. But when we do manage to do that, we discover that there's a whole universe internally inside of us that we were totally oblivious to. We are so externalized, we are so impressed by the outside world. Our senses attract the mind all the time to run around 
that when we manage finally to find this internal state, interiorized state, the level of inner peace and discovery that we will have is simply staggering. And a lot of people are scared of it. They're scared, what will I find in there? Who is my true self? I've never really sat quietly and just observed my own self all the time. I was just measuring myself by the outside world. People actually do that all the time. You talk to someone and you tell them, I don't know what I'm thinking. Can you help me? What do you think I'm thinking? What do you think I should do? What is your opinion? It's hard for us to actually have clarity on our own self because this self-introspection is almost non-existent, not in its spiritual sense. And that's where uh, concentration of the mind is so essential. So to say, I am doing meditation, but actually I've never trained my mind. And if my mind is totally chaotic, it's simply impossible. It's impossible. It's like trying to say that someone wants to lift a heavy weight while never ever trained their muscle. Never went to the gym, can't lift more than a kilo, and now they want to lift 100 kilo just like that. It's simply impossible, period. You might fake it, you might do all kinds of so-called meditations where the mind is actually getting a lot of stimulation and fun, jumping around, screaming meditation, dancing meditation. It's very satisfying for the, what we call in yoga, the monkey mind, but it's not really going where it should go and it doesn't give the results that we want. So that's really interesting, Soma. I guess for a lot of modern people, they're under the perception that meditation is a form of learning control or concentration of the mind. But you're quite clearly saying it's a different step um, and that's a step that comes beforehand. Could you maybe expand on that a little bit to help clarify the difference in that? Actually, it is true that the practice of meditation itself will contribute to a degree sometimes to a significant degree to our own ability to work with the mind and control the mind. I'm not denying that. But it's like trying to go completely the roundabout way instead of doing it the more structured, proper way. That's why when Patanjali in his Yoga Sutras describes meditation as the step and before that, he describes the step which is concentration of the mind. He does it for a reason. He was not accidentally doing it. So um, that's why meditation can never really grow properly without the mind being uh, much more ready for it. Patanjali even goes further than that and says that even before we try to work with our mind to concentrate, to focus it, we need to also learn how to control an even more basic level of the mind, and that is how to control our senses. To learn to isolate our senses from the external disturbances, because our senses are so used to, we are, we are all educated this way, we are all brainwashed, you might say, this way, that whenever there is a stimulation of any kind, the sense related to that stimulation will immediately get engaged will be involved in it. There's a very fascinating smell. My sense of smell is triggered. There's something interesting to see. My eyes are running after it, and so on and so forth. That in itself is already an issue. And he, in Patanjali's teachings, he explains that if we can already at that point learn to dial it back somehow and train our senses not to jump every time something comes up, that already will serve as a certain basis, he calls it pratyahara, for this. On top of that, once that is achieved, then the human being can start thinking about more working with the mind. Because he can't work with the mind if it keeps jumping all over the place because of the stimulations which are there. So, if we stop for a second and really look back at all that we've said so far, sorry, but it's all about control. And I'm saying sorry because really, as a teacher, I can see again and again how many students struggle with that. And students literally would do anything to find a teaching that actually encourages 
the wild, chaotic, free, spirited attitude of the mind. Anything that tells me that I can just be myself and allow myself to just go free and spontaneously let my mind run amok, do whatever the heck it wants, that sounds like a much better teaching to a lot of students. And I don't blame them. This is how we are. We enjoy these things where we, it doesn't actually take effort. Because if I just allow myself to just go free, the mind will just do whatever it wants, which it does anyway, then it feels much more comfortable. It's like when you go into a river with a strong current, the easiest thing to do is just lay back and let the current take you. Even if it takes you to a waterfall that eventually will take you to your death. But it's so easy just to let go and let the current do the work for you. But if you want to get somewhere, you need to swim against the current. And that requires determination, requires control, requires effort. And these requirements are not very attractive to the modern individual. Modern people, as many of the yoga texts say, are many times plagued by agitation and especially lethargy just feeling very inert, very heavy. And the, the way to, to act, to be more proactive, is very challenging from that perspective. And that's why, as we look at this more and more, we will always observe that it's about taking a stand with your own self, not with others. It's easy to take a stand with another person. We always see the problems with other people. It's hard for us to observe what's going on in our own uh, inner domain, so to speak, and that's why if we can do that, then indeed we can start talking about proper mental powers, proper control over the mind, success with the mind, and proper meditation. I'm hearing very clearly then, Samananda, that um, it's really important in uh, meditation to ha be disciplined and to create a practice. What would you be recommending for people on a daily basis as their kind of discipline and practice? When it comes to daily practice, before we touch that point, I would say that first of all, the person needs to make sure that they have the right teachings. If they are indeed having a proper teacher who is accomplished in what they do and have had reached themselves uh, results spiritually and can meditate properly, and they have a, a certain practice that was given to them, like let's say that they have certain techniques that they know how to do, then they can start talking about a daily practice. And in a daily practice, I would always recommend to have a certain amount of time. It could even be 15, 20 minutes a day, where a person works with their minds on their concentration, just training the concentration ability of the mind. Because concentration is like a muscle in the body. It requires regular work for it to be fit. If we just drop it and don't do anything with our abilities of concentration, they deteriorate. So we need to daily, on a daily basis, work with our mind's abilities to concentrate. And there are very uh, clear techniques for that in the yoga tradition. Once we've done that, we can take maybe 30 minutes a day. It could be longer if the person has time to practice a certain meditation technique. Once practicing meditation with concentration on a daily basis, we can say already the person is having a very proper, I would say a, a pretty good uh, training or daily practice that can help them to move on forwards successfully. Of course, yogis who are devoting themselves more to the spiritual path and uh, take away distractions from their lives, like let's say that they devote themselves to living in a more calm environment and having more hours daily free for spirituality will do a lot more. I know many yogis who practice one, two, three hours a day and many who do longer than that. And then you can add more practice, more meditation, more yoga practice, more pranayama, more uh, purification techniques. And by doing that, the evolution is accelerated much, much more. Uh, when you start to practice um, and you have a teacher, uh, there are a number of different techniques that um, are available to learn? Yes. In our courses we offer a, a wide range of techniques. And that's on purpose because everyone's different and 
you can't expect, it's not logical, that one technique or two techniques will be fitting for everybody. People have different temperament, the mind works in different ways. People have different type of uh, personal style and character. And that's why uh, there can be different techniques that fit different people. And in the courses that we offer, we make sure to offer a wide array of techniques. We practice all of them. So the person has many hours of retreat to really uh, devote to all those techniques and discover for themselves which techniques are much more profound for them, give better effects, which techniques um, are not so strong and then they might want to push on those another time or maybe even sooner than that. And by doing that, we can allow ourselves to really find what fits best to our character and it gives us a much faster evolution. On top of that, we also discover what doesn't fit us and then maybe we want to take some time at some point in the future to focus on that because it strengthens some of our weaknesses. And in this way, a person can de uh, develop very nicely. Thank you very much, Samananda, for the insights. I think that will really help a lot of our students and our viewers. Thank you. Thank you.